Hi, my name is Kevin Downing, and I'd like to welcome you to ICBF's webinar on dairy genomics. Genomics essentially is a tool that allows us to more accurately predict an animal's performance at an earlier stage. So it's like adding more pieces to an incomplete jigsaw. And while there are many benefits to genotyping and genomics, there's also plenty of challenges. We'll discuss one of those challenges revolving around prediction bias, how it's affecting the EBI, and we'll also outline the plan changes being implemented in next October's proof run to correct this bias. Joining me to discuss these challenges and changes are Professor Donna Berry, who is Head of Quantitative Genetics in Chagas, and also Dr. Ross Evans, who manages the genetics team within ICBF. Donna is going to provide us with an international perspective on how prediction bias is a common experience and also how he'll outline how it's being addressed in other countries. Ross will then go on to outline the work that ICBF is currently doing about this prediction bias and how it will impact the EBI evaluations next October. So I'd like to hand you over to Donna Berry, who will give us a flavour of what's happening in other countries and when it comes to dealing with prediction bias. So Donna, over to you. Okay, thanks Kev. Just before we launch into the challenges, I'd firstly like to acknowledge some of the opportunities or achievements we have made to date with using this genomic technology. And to illustrate that, I wanna just quickly go through this equation. It's called the Breeders' Equation, and, and it's a driver of genetic gain per year. So the first component or feature that drives genetic gain is the intensity of selection. Be it we, so in other words, we select the top 1% versus the top 5%. And by, by more intense selection, we can achieve genetic gain. In blue, there is the accuracy of selection, just another word for reliability of genetic evaluation. So in other words, how accurate can you identify the, the best animals from the worst animals, the reliability of those EBIs? The higher the accuracy, the higher the reliability, the faster the genetic gain all is being equal. And yellow is the genetic variability. Uh, you can really do a huge amount of that from a genomic perspective, other than acknowledging the fact that inbreeding tends to reduce the extent of the genetic variability. And then under the line there in kind of reddish orange is what we call the generation interval, or how fast we turn around these generations. Now, in the initial days of genomic evaluation, when people were talking about the benefit of genomics for increasing genetic gain, they were really focusing on more accurate selection. And that's correct. Genomic evaluations do give you more accuracy of selection compared to traditional parental averages. But it also enables you to increase the intensity of your selection. So rather than selecting our project testing maybe 70 to 100 bulls per year, it allows us to screen thousands of bulls and selecting, therefore, more intense. Also, it allows us to turn the generations around a lot faster. So the generation interval before was around six, six and a half years. It's a lot shorter now. And I'll talk about this later on. That in itself is opening up some challenges for us at a global level. The other important point I want to address is the fact that genomic evaluations or DNA technology are also allowing us to correct the parentage, which in, the, which in itself is providing us with more precise EBIs. Even forgetting about genomic evaluations, our traditional evaluations are more accurate because we're able to resolve a lot of the pedigree of, of individuals. And that in itself, of course, is enabling us to have more accurate mating plans to minimize the, the chance of inbreeding. That gives us more accurate genetic evaluations, but so does the ability to better predict the breeds of individual animals. Um, because once it, one of the parents are crossbred, it's impossible to know the actual breed composition of the calf without using DNA technology. So all of these benefits are culminating into faster genetic gain. And we can see that from this slide. This is the change in EBI in black, the, the milk subindex in blue, and the fertility subindex in red of Irish dairy cows by year of their first having. Uh, this is without any genomics inside it, so this is purely traditional evaluation. Process in neural terms is on the vertical axis. We can see there, it's just focused on the EBI, the black line, for example, really good genetic gain up until the around year 2009, 2010. That's when we started introducing genomic evaluations, and then we can see the trajectory really gets a lot sharper. So if you compare, for example, the EBI of 2010 versus that of around 2020, so Today, there's a difference of around 120 euros EPI. So in other words, a difference of about 240 euros more profit for lactation, uh, with genomics contributing to that uh, acceleration in genetic gain. 
And therefore, it's no surprise as to where, why the uptake of geotagging isn't so massive. So here I'm just showing you uh, the US in red and Ireland on the right hand side by the year across the bottom of, of the, the both graphs, so the year of geotagging. Number of geotags is on the, on the vertical axis. What we can see in the US, for example, today, they have around 4 million dairy animal genotypes. Um, we can see that that's increasing at an increasing rate. We call it an exponential growth, a bit like actually the, the COVID pand pandemic in the early days. We're seeing the same in Ireland, but the scale is a bit less. So rather than the 4 million, we have 200,000 Irish dairy animals genotypes. But again, it's really the, the rate of that increase is what's really interesting. There's a lot more people genotyping their individual animals. That, of course, is, is opening us uh, new challenges. One of the first challenges we met was what I call the exhaustion of, of SAR genotype information. So all countries that introduced genomic evaluations, the first thing they did was to genotype the AI SARS because they were the most informative. They had high reliability, so you got a bigger bang for your buck for genotyping those animals. But of course, there's a limit to the number of uh, AI SARS available, and once that's exhausted, then if you want to increase your, what we call your training population, you have to genotype females. And that's what Ireland and all other countries in the world have been doing. They're now genotyping females, where have, they have their DNA information and their performance information. And by collating all that data together in what we call the training and the reference population, it allows us to estimate the DNA profile most suitable for Ireland, such as EBI, milk production, fertility, cactus, whatever. One of the other things, as I said back earlier from the equation, was the rate of generation turnover is increasing dramatically. So now what we have in some countries is we have young test bulls, genomically tested young bulls, where their grandparents still don't even have any progeny information. And in the two-step approach, which we use, so it's two steps from a genomic evaluation perspective, like what most countries do, is what we do is we get a DNA or a genomic evaluation, and we blend that together with the old parentage or, or traditional uh, pedigree evaluation. Now, if the parents don't have any progeny, then their parental reliability is actually pretty low. So what you actually happen then when you blend the two of them together is you put proportionally more weight on the genomic evaluation. One way to get around a lot of these issues is what's called, rather than this two-step, is to use a single-step or a one-step evaluation. And that is all sounds lovely. Computationally, the computer work is really intense, really hard on the computer, and that we can get it going in some evaluations, but once you move, and this is the same globally, once you move to very large data sets and very complex models, the whole thing kind of crashes. So it's really, given where we are, that exponential growth of genotyping, probably based on the current state of the art, it's not that sustainable going into the future. So that's a huge challenge. And all of these three challenges then lead to what we call genomic bias. So genomic bias is where you, uh, is where the uh, genomic proof of an animal is an overestimation relative to its true genetic. And it's a global phenomenon. I'm just going to show you the, the data from the US. I could show you almost any country in the world here. So on the top left here, we have the, the data release of genomic evaluations. On the vertical, they call it the NM, the net merit index. It's, it's the same as the EBI, except this is the net merit for, for, for uh, the US. You can see the, the two lines. The blue is the genomic evaluation of young test bulls, and the yellow is their proof today based on traditional daughter proven evaluation. So what you can see is the blue line is overestimating the value or the net merit or the EBI equivalent of the young bull. And this is what we call genomic price. Just below that, we can see what we call histogram of distribution. Um, and this is how a young bull's proof changes from a genomic bull, and um, when it's very, very young, to today, where it has plenty of daughters given it uh, contributing to its genetic evaluation. What would you would hope is that on average, there's a zero change. Yes, some will go up and some will go down, but on average, you'd expect them to be zero, the change. That's what the yellow line is. So you'd expect most of the data to be in around the yellow line, but we're not seeing that. We're seeing that most of the data is on the, to the left of the yellow line. It's negative, which means that the genomic proof on average, was overestimating the traditional proof. And we see, look, there's a bull down there at minus 430. So in that instance, the genomic proof overestimating the bull by 430 units. Of course, we have some on the right as well, where underestimated bulls 
by 270 euros. And that's always going to happen. Even when we correct the genomic bias issue, that's going to happen. But what we don't like is the fact that on average, they're dropping by around 89 points. Again, as I said, it's a global phenomenon. I'm just showing you, that was the US I showed you on the last slide um, for the total merit index, the EBI equivalent. Here on the left, I'm showing you the same from confirmation from a Canadian perspective. On the right-hand side, it's protein percentage from, uh, from Denmark. Won't go through the great details, but what this GPS bias is, that's your genomic bias. So the blue line on the left-hand side is, is what, what Canada predicted for these young test bulls. And the red is what their proof is today based on progeny. So it overestimated their confirmation, exactly the same on the right hand side. And Denmark overestimated their protein percentage. So it's a global phenomenon. And it's an active area of research. We've, we've known this, it was happening for several years. We had a bias uh, adjustment for milk production in the uh, EBI since the year 2013. Everybody around the world is trying to figure out just how do we actually correct it. So, real active. Um, piece of research going on globally. Big question, I guess, is well, what's causing all of this bias? Um, and here I'm giving you four possible contributing factors that we think of or that we know of. There may be more as we dig into this a, a lot more. So the first one is, and we just go through these individually, the first one is there always was bias. So even in the traditional genetic evaluations, in many countries, they overestimate them based on their project performance. We've looked at this and learned not that big of an issue for the traits that we have looked at. Um, but look, the, the good news is there's a solution to it. Um, so our genetic evaluations, what we do before we actually do them, is we estimate what is called the heritability. It's how much of the genetic variant of the differences among animals is due to genetics. And that can change over time. So we update that every few years, every maybe five to 10 years. And probably we need to do that more regularly. We would traditionally use historical data but we need to move, now move to using more recent data. So look, there is an option there to correct some of that. Arguably, a bit more important, I would argue, is the whole selective genotyping of animals. So farmers are only genotyping a handful of their cows, the good cows, or the animals that they perceive to be the good cows, which is completely understandable. But just to use an analogy, imagine if you had used one bull on your farm and you had plenty of daughters, and half of them look really good from a linear classification perspective, and half of them didn't look so good. So when the linear classifier came out, he actually hid the bad half behind the shed, said nothing about him. The linear classifier came out, all he saw was the good ones, classified those animals as really good, and lo and behold, the bull will come up as being very, very good from a linear classification perspective. So it's exactly the same with genotyping. If you only genotype the good animals, then you overestimate and the potential of that individual group. Again, good news is there's a solution. The solution is whole herd genotyping, particularly at a very young age, at calves, ideally, because we have mortality going on. Also, we have the selection of heifers going on from a confirmation and a looks perspective, but also uh, some of them won't go in calves. Uh, we know from our research that only around 76% of, of calves that are born, female uh, dairy calves, actually go on to calves down. So it's really important that we look at full herd recording. The third one, bigger from an international perspective, North America, your big issue, I would say, is the preferential treatment of females in the training population. So these animals that are genotyped, they're obviously genotyped for a reason. The farmers think that they're potentially full dams. So it's logical that when they're inside in the parlor, rather than giving them one pull of nuts, you might give this one three pull of nuts. And of course, the genetic evaluation doesn't know you did that. It just assumes that all animals in that herd or treated the same. So she's going to milk more because she's getting better con more concentrates, and then that will feed into her genetic evaluation, which makes her look better than what she truly is from a genetic perspective. Easy solution, delete all of those animals, um, the genotyped animals from the, from the training population, but that kind of defeats the whole purpose of it, because we, you don't know that maybe that female is genetically elite, so she was probably one of the best bull dams around. So you don't actually want to delete her because she's exactly the animal that you want to identify. So preferential treatment is really, really difficult to find those particular animals where they purposely treated or are they just complete freaks of nature and are really, really good. The fourth one, which is, is really, I would argue, contributing to, the, to this bias, is the pace at which we're turning around these generations. So we knew, we always knew there was a little bit of bias per generation. 
But if you, but it kind of um, retrained or recorrected itself once you had progeny information. But now, what we're seeing is that the young testicles globally across the world have um, they, their sire has no daughter, so it has he hasn't recorrected his proof. So we have a, what we call a culmination or an addition of this bias across generations. And like if we look at 10 years ago, right, 90% of the candidate sires, bulls, candidate young bulls, had sires in the training population with daughters. 90%. Compared to now, only 12% of those young bulls actually have sires who have progeny information. So they have kind of recorrected their, their um, breeding values. So what are people doing? Ross is going to talk uh, afterwards about what Ireland is doing, and just very quickly, what, what are people doing globally to minimize this genomic bias? A very simple one, we've used this for the MIPS sub-index since the year 2013, once we recognized that there was an overestimation of around 10, 10 euros, we just simply subtracted that uh, 10 euros from the MIPS sub-index, and that has worked very, very well. What we're moving towards now, and Ross is going into a bit more detail, but if we look internationally or globally, what people are doing is they're shrinking the estimate of genetic merit for these young bulls. Some of them are doing it by trait. So, for example, a shrinkage example mathematically would be 90% uh, shrinkage. So, if you had a bull with uh, 100 euros of EBI, if you applied a 90% shrinkage to that bull, you'd come down from 100 to 90. Right? Some countries are doing that trait by trait, so there might be a 90% shrinkage for milk, 70% shrinkage for fertility, 85% shrinkage for, for somatic cell count. Um, and they have different technologies, and Ross will talk about that, different techniques of how you deduce that. Other countries are looking at shrinkage based on the distance of that young bull from the training population. So if the sire has daughter information, they might shrink that young bull's proof by 90%. But if the sire doesn't have daughter information, so if it goes back to the grandsire, it's the, it's the nearest ancestor with progeny information, then they might shrink it not by 90%, but by 80% because of this culmination of bias across generations, which I just talked about. So there are, there are different ways of doing it. And as I said, Ross is going to talk about uh, how we're proposing to do it from an Irish perspective. So just to, to summarize and take home messages is that genomics has really added to accelerating genetic, and I've shown you the data on that, just even from a traditional evaluation perspective, it's making them more precise. Also, it's providing a lot more information than just genomic EBIs or genomic milk of indexes or fertility of indexes, correcting the parentage and all those other multitude of things like lethal recessive mutations, et cetera, that we can monitor over time. Uh, also, as I said, bias was always an issue. We knew it, and uh, we did the research back in around 2012. Uh, we identified that we were overestimating the milk of index for around 10 euros, and then in 2013, we corrected that with a simple subtraction factor, and I think that has worked pretty well. Uh, we didn't do it for fertility. Fertility takes a lot more time to get more accurate evaluations. It's really only now is when you can look at where we really overestimating fertility, and that's what Ross is going to talk about. As I said, uh, to get around this, countries are now moving away from this simple subtraction to applying a shrinkage factor, uh, but most of them really applying it on a trace by trace basis. So, Kevin, that, that's all I have uh, to say. Um, as I said, this is a global phenomenon, and it's an active area of research of trying to minimize this genomic production bias. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Donna, for that really insightful perspective of what's happening in other countries in terms of genomic bias. Um, I'd now like to call on Ross Evans to present his slides on how Ireland is dealing with the issue. So over to you, Ross. Thanks, Kevin. So as Donna has given the uh, the perspective from an international perspective on on the impact of you know the old prediction in in in, in genomic programs worldwide this talk is is geared towards addressing over prediction from an irish context uh, in relation to the irish dairy genomic evaluations and in terms of the overview there's about seven main items to cover and uh, the first one is a brief outline of the icbf genomic evaluation process the second one is covering the benefits of genomics and how we how we measure the benefits. The third one is the impact that genomics has now had on the usage of a, a young AI sires in the Irish population. The fourth one is the impact of genomics on subsequent, subsequent impact on, on generation interval, which is the age gap between the young calf and its sire. 
the fifth one is the challenges that we are now seeing with large scale usage of genomic sires. Um, the sixth uh, item will be uh, the solution being being implemented to address the overprediction problem. And the seventh item will be the impact that this solution is having on AI sires and more recently genotyped animals. So if we look at the the first item on the agenda, basically just a brief outline of the, the genomic evaluation process. So genomics combines pedigree-based evaluations with genotypes and gives a genomic proof. And pedigree-based evaluations have been around for, for, for 20 or 30 years at this stage, and they basically uh, utilize the pedigree recorded uh, traditionally on pedigree animals uh, with phenotypes which are created into traits such as milk fat protein uh, fertility somatic cell count calving difficulty etc and they produce a, a traditional breeding value uh, or pta uh, for every trait which are then amalgamated into an overall profit index and weighted by by economic weights for each trait so in the in the advent of of dna technology um we are now getting access to 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 large scale genotype arrays and you can see down here basically this is a snapshot of the type of information that comes back on on an animal um, and there's usually just a, somewhere in the region of 50,000 pieces of DNA information. The first thing that that DNA information can be, the first place that DNA information can be utilized is to confirm that the pedigree is correct. And if it's not, it will help us to predict a sire um, or predict, predict a, a dam if there's, if, if there's dam errors. So that the the traditional evaluation then can, and parental average can be, can be properly uh, uh, created for that particular animal. Second piece then is, is the actual genomic predictions. So that SNP data, 50,000 pieces of information, um, are combined with what we call a reference population. This, these are a group of animals that we know have a quite a reliable traditional evaluation. It's based on their own progeny or, or their own performance themselves if they're females. And this reference population grows every evaluation with, with new data coming in. So that when 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 that data is combined with the SNP array, we get 50,000 pieces of information from which then we can estimate the pure genomic component on a young animal, okay? that And that's called a direct genomic value. That is then combined with the traditional evaluation to give what we call a blended genomic proof, which is the, the, the value that's published on each trait. And again, that replaces the traditional uh, EBI profit index value in place of that uh, and puts that genomic evaluation in place of, of the traditional traditional value. So the second item on the agenda is the benefit of genomics and how is the benefit of genomics measured? Well, it's, it's measured using well-recognized validation techniques. And usually this involves where uh, the censoring of some daughter information for a particular group of more recent sires, and their prediction with no data is then compared with their subsequent daughter proven proof. Um, and invariably, most most tests usually go back about four years, drop out, censor the four years of data, and then they predict forward and compare it to the to the current valuation. So in the in this analysis, we've used 262 AI sires born since 2010, and they have a minimum of 50 daughters in milk in 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 Ireland. And the measure that we use to describe the 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 fit or the the, the prediction is called a correlation. And it, it describes the strength of an association between two variables. And if we look at here, you can see four different types of correlation. The first one is a correlation of one, which is a perfect correlation. And in, in, you, you very, very rarely see this in, 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 in the real world. Um, it's, it's where every point on the, on the x-axis is an exact equal to every point on, on the y-axis. So you're, you're predicting here with 100% accuracy, which in, in, invariably is, is, is never reached in, 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 in most real life settings. A high positive correlation can be termed as correlation that's 0.8 or greater. And you can see by and large that the animals that are lower on, 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 on one uh, in indicator are lower on the other, and the ones that are higher on one are higher on the other, with a little bit of movement off the, 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 the center line there. A low positive correlation, you can say it's about 0.3. You can see again, the 
the predictor variable is predicting the 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 right direction of the of the uh, the the other variable, but you you tend to get a lot of movement. So a, a case uh, of an animal here that that is is high in one, um, and it's it's a little bit higher on on the other measure and. This one, this 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 point down here, or this this particular animal is lower on one and higher on the other, and that's a, a case where the correlation is indicating a weak association between two variables. This one here is where you get no no association, so you don't have any association between your your predictor variable and your your resulting uh, variable that you that you want to predict. So we have done. This prediction um, in the context of those 262 AI sires, and we've looked at the five main traits here involved in the EBI: milk fat, protein, somatic cell count, and calving interval. Uh, and you can see here the first correlation column uh, with correlations in it is where we have a parent average. So if we only had parent average four years ago, and we use that parent average uh, to rank these animals, how do they rank? Uh, four years later, well, I suppose in in all cases the correlation is is positive, which which is good. But we see that it is stronger for the more heritable traits such as milk, uh, fat, protein, smack cell count, with calving interval a less heritable trait having a lower correlation. Compare this then to a situation where we have males only in a in, in a genomic reference population and we're, we're predicting a genomic breeding value to compare with that parent average. What we see here in, in each of the traits is, the, is that the correlation improves as we go from parent average to, to genomics. Okay, And the change that was made in the spring was in relation to including informative females in the reference population. And you can see that, that in all cases here that the correlation improved again further. Um, uh, where where you have females in the reference population over and above where you only have males in the reference population. So at a high level summary, we're saying that genomic rankings are a better predictor of the subsequent daughter proving rankings than parental average. Highly heritable traits such as milk fat protein predict better than lower heritable traits such as fertility. And that male and female trained genomics are better than male only. Okay, and on the back of, of this, this validation work, females were added to the training population in January 2020. The next item on the agenda is in the year of genomics, what has been the impact uh, in terms of young sire usage? And what we've done here is, is broken up into three time periods. The first time period is the 2000 to 2008 period, which is a pre-genomic the pre-genomic period, genomics came in, in 2009, the 2009-2014 period, um, which was the early genomic period, and the 2015 to 2020 period, which is the later genomic period. And you can see in the initial period, there was 263 sires who had their first calving year in that 2000-2008 period. Okay, and here you can see this column is the average number of calves. Uh, and you can see in that first year, there was 135, an average of 135 calvings per sire. Okay, you can see in the second year, there was an, also an average of 135, and in the third year, there was an average of 121. Now, if we move on to the next period in time, which is the, the early genomic era, we can see that, that, that the, the average cal number of calves per sire increased to 191. Um, but, and it was a significant increase in, in year two, where it's gone from 135 to 605. So, so in this initial era, era of genomics, we, we saw a, a large increase in number of calves born to these young sires in their, in their second year. In the, old, in, the old, in the older days, a lot of these sires would have been held for a voluntary waiting period until uh, uh, a daughter proven proof came through. But in the in the genomics area, there tended to be a lot more usage uh, in in in, the, in those early years. And you can see here when we move into the the, the later genomic era, uh, the average in the first calving year was 282 calves. In the second year, it climbed to an average of 1,046 calvings, and the third year, 671. Okay. And this here is just showing the maximum number of calves. Okay, so you can see that that in the pre-genomics era, uh, the maximum 
number of calves in the first year for a individual sire was 925 and that climbed to 3200 for the, the in the second year that that bull was 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 used um but you can see in the genomics area the, the there are very popular bulls out there that tend to get used an awful lot so the, there's a, a, a particular bull there that has had 13,000 almost 14,000 calvings in his second year of use uh, and that climbed to 20,000 calves in the 2015 to 2020 period. So in summary, the genomics era has resulted in much heavier usage of young sires in, 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 in the population. So this is a follow on slide, which is really building on the previous slide, which shows the impact that the usage of those young sires has had on what we call the generation interval. OK, and we talk about generation interval, we talk about the gap between the calf and his sire and, and also between the sire and his maternal grandsire. So if you look at the, the blue line here, it just shows you the the number of an, of calves born. So so the, the blue line here is is relative to, the, to this axis here. You can see that, that in around 1000 to 1002, we had somewhere in the region of 200,000 calves born to, to AI. And these are black and white house Frisian calves. And that has climbed to over uh, 450,000 calves uh, in, in more recent years. So the level of AI usage has increased, but also the population has got has, has got bigger as, as well. And I suppose, look, in, in 2009 was the first year that genomic sires were, were used. Um, you can you can see the, the 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 bar here, which is indicating the 2010 calvings, which would have been the first years of those genomic sires calving down. And what I want to draw your attention to here is the uh, the first one is the orange line, which is the the sire to calf age gap. So that is suggesting that that in that pre genomics period, the, the average uh, age between the calf and its sire was was between eight and ten years, and you can see that 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 with the advent of genomics that that gap has slowly de uh, has well I'd say reasonably quickly declined uh, to a stage where it's now about five years. So the average age between a calf and his sire is is five years. So it's indicating that those si AI sires that are being used the population are, are much younger than they were previous to this. The the grey line is just showing the the sire the, the the maternal grandsire to sire so so the ai sires that are used the population how old are they so how old is their sire relative to the to, to the to the to the ai sire himself and you can see again um it has really that gap the, the generation interval has really declined in the in the in the genomic era uh, so now it's down to to about um, three and a half years, and the yellow line just really is showing the impact of 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 the generation interval shortening in both the calf to the sire and also the the sire to his own maternal grandsire. And you can see that 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 back in 2000, 2002, it was nearly a fifteen year gap between the calf born and and his and his maternal grandsire uh, maternal grandsire's date of birth, and now that is down to about eight years. So that's a significant change in the population uh, dynamic in terms of the usage of these young sires. So the fifth item on the agenda is the challenges associated with this large scale adoption of genomics that we've just covered. OK, and what we have in this particular slide is we've just shown the last five years um, and the genotype calves that the calves born that had been genotyped was part of the breeding program. You can see that in 2016, it was just shy of 9,000, and that has climbed to, to 11,000 in, in, in 2020. And just putting some more numbers on that previous slide in the uh, uh, the previous graph, we can see that that the the, the sire to calf age gap uh, in 2016 is four. Uh, and in 2020, it's 3.2. So, so, so genomics is really pushing down that generation interval even, even, even further. And again, on the maternal grandsire to sire age gap, it's gone from 4.4 to 2.9 in the last in the last five years. Um, and this uh, this has an impact in terms of the 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 relationship between the young genotyped animals and the sires that are being used to train the genomics on those young sires. And on those young calves, and if you look at the the proportion of the young calves that were born, where their sires 
are in the reference population. You can see uh, the 2016 calves now um, have almost all their sires in the reference population. And you can move across here to the more recent years. You can see the 2019 calves that were born, 73% of their sires are now in the milk reference population. But if you look at the, the 2020 born calves, only 19% or one in five has their sire in the training population, okay? And you, you can see the, the reliability of the sires, uh, milk, or, milk evaluation reliability here, it's down at 53% for the 2020 born calves, okay? In the context of fertility, which is a later expression trait, you can see that that situation is 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 actually uh, even more extreme, and that there's only 17% of the calves genotyped in 2020 have a sire that's in the fertility reference population. Okay, so the, as, uh, just to cover again, to make that fertility reference population, the sire has to be genotyped, but he also has to be informative. He has to have daughters in the system which uh, are allowing him to, 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 to have some level of predictability in, in that genomic reference population. And you can see the average fertility reliability within that, uh, within that sire, within the, for the sires of those young 2020 calves is only 39%, okay? So just to summarize, Reduced generation interval is good for genetic gain. You're, if, if the breeding program is picking up uh, uh, higher genetic merit young calves, then it's better to have a, a younger generation interval, uh, a, a, sm a smaller generation interval. And Donna covered that in his talk. So you have younger sires and you have younger sire sons. But one of the, I suppose, the consequences of that is that there is a wider uh, relationship gap emerging between the young genotype candidates and the proven animals in the reference population. And this is one of the known reasons that cause over prediction with genomic evaluations. And it is, it is called second generation genomic selection. So first gen generation genomic selection would be where you have uh, well-proven parents in the, in the training population and they're predicting the, the, the next generation. Well, now we are moving on uh, at, a rate, at a pace where the, the parent isn't, is that young, uh, parent isn't in the trained population at this stage and you're 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 going back a generation to the to the well proven maternal grandsire. So the solution that we are implementing to address this this issue of, of second generation um, genomic candidates and and the 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 over prediction of the of the, the direct genomic value it's a solution that's applied in US genomic evaluations who apply the same methodology as, as ICBF do uh, in the context of dairy genomics. It involves identifying the optimum weighting between geno the genomic component, which is that direct genomic value, and the parent, the parent average in order to do a number of key things. The first one is to maximize the prediction accuracy or the correlation as described earlier. The second one is to minimize the over prediction. Um, and it is important to bear in mind that each trait potentially has a different option, op as a different optimum. Um, the, milk the milk traits, we're we have found that the, the optimum weighting based on the current population and the, the current data available is a, is, a, is a weighting, a maximum weighting of 70% on, on the pure genomic component. In fertility traits, it is, it is slightly lower, slightly more over prediction with the fertility. Um, and that maximum weighting is 50%. Health, and or health in the form of somatic cell count, the maximum weighting is, is 90%. Uh, there, is a way, there is a weighting of, of 0.7 that has, has been implemented on the calving since the new calving was brought in, in in spring 2020. And it's important to bear in mind that these weightings will be reviewed annually as, as the, the, the as new data comes in, but also the, 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 the profile of genotyped animals increases in in, in, in in the spring 2020 evaluations, we saw a lot of informative females coming into the reference population, and that female reference population will be growing. So it is important to review these weightings uh, on an annual basis and, and make adjustments if, if, if necessary. The seventh point uh, to cover is what impact is this solution going to have um, at an AI sire level uh, and also at the level of genotype calves. Well, if we look at the the year of birth, um, 
table here over here, we can see that that we have AI sire AI sire averages. You can see that in the context of AI sires born in the in in the earlier years of the of 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 the last decade, you can see that the average change is going to be somewhere in the region of about three euros. The average and uh, the average uh, the average. Average can be a positive or a negative value. So in some some cases here, you will have some animals that will benefit slightly from from this correction in that their 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 economic value is predicting slightly lower than the than than their parental average. So capping the maximum at 0.7 is is having an impact on some of these animals in a positive way, and uh, and 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 some others is causing a drop in 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 value. So you can see there that that the the the, the averages for the for the the first seven or eight years of the of that uh, animals born in in in, in that decade um, are moving by an average of between two and and, and five euros. The more the the, the, the the genomic overprediction is is really impacting the most recent generations. So if we look at here, we have the the 2018 born AI sires, of which there's 115 of them. Um, they would see a correction back of about 22 euros. The 2019 uh, AI sired, these are the, the youngest group of AI sired calves at this stage are 37. They'll drop by about 37 euros. The 2020, you can see there's an A and a B here. The 2020A are the currently procured AI calves uh, picked up by AI companies uh, in, in, in 2020. And 2020B is all genotyped animals. So there's some in the region of about 20,000 genotyped animals. And the the AI procured calves will come back by about 78 euros. Um, the all genotype animals on average will come back by about 31 euros and here you can see that the the you can see the the, the level of change at an individual animal level um so um in 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 some cases you will see animals being corrected back by in the region of of up, uppers of, of 100 euros um and some animals do benefit as well. So some animals will, will climb in the region of, of, of 60, 70 euros. I suppose if you look at this next column here, this is the new EBI that 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 we are seeing. So so you can see that that there is genetic progress over time. So going from 100 euros in 2010 to 209 euros in 2018, which reflects the current active AI sires. Um, uh, but you can see that the next generation of animals are are they're more genetically elite than than what has gone before. So your 2019 group are at 249 euros, and this is post the correction. The 2020 group are at 300 euros, uh, and and they are they are a selected group of the 2020 all genotype calves, which are at 216 euros. So the important point to to bear in mind with the with the 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 solution to just to, to account for the over prediction is that is that by and large the rankings are pretty stable. Um, if you look at the at the correlation here, 0.97. If we bear in mind the the previous slide showing the the, the association between two variables, the correlation of 0.97 is very 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 strong. So the rankings are 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 very are very stable in in all these older age categories. Where a lot of these animals uh, have a lot of their own data, so genomics has a, a, a reduced contribution to their proof. So, so the correction isn't having a big impact in in uh, at a at a group level in that sense. The 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 2020 born animals are, that have been selected for AI, the correlation uh, with this, with 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 the, the the current evaluation is about 0.85, and across all genotyped animals, it's about 0.93. And this this Graph here is just reflecting the 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 data that's in the in the table, um, and you can see that the EBI here is the the top the top line here is the current EBI, and you can see uh, the the genetic progress that has been made over time, um, and currently those animals uh, the 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 2020 young crop are 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 somewhere in the region of 370 euros, and with the with the the solution being applied, they will be corrected back to be uh, about an average of 300, of 300 euros. 
most of the over prediction in the Irish context is coming from uh, over prediction on the fertility sub index. Okay, so you can see that 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 in the context of of where those animals are currently, they're getting corrected corrected back uh, in the context of the young 2020 group of AI sires selected calf for for, for AI, and they'll come from a fertility sub index of about 200 euros back to about 125 euros. So in summary, we have used internationally recognised validation tests applied to the Irish data, and they show that genomics outperforms conventional parent average predictions in the context of being able to 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 to, to rank animals better uh, first day compared to where those animals do end up once they've got their daughter proven proofs. As the adoption of technology has grown over the years, and as we've shown, it has been implemented um, very vigorously in Ireland, overprediction has become a bigger issue, and it's become a bigger issue in the context of fertility in the Irish context. Um, the solution being applied is published and implemented in the largest genomic evaluation in the world, in, 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 in the US. Um, the changes that we are proposing here will be implemented in the October evaluation run, which will be published on the 6th of October. Okay, so thanks Ross very much for that presentation. I know you've put a lot of work into this whole area over the last six to 12 months. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that when the evaluations are published on the 6th of October, we'll have a more accurate predictor of an animal's genetic performance. One question I might put to you is maybe you could comment on why do you see the fertility as being um, the, the, the sub index that's showing the, the greater bias as opposed to milk or any of the other uh, sub indices, or indeed, or any of the other sub indices showing uh, bias in your um, research? Yes, Kevin. I, I suppose it's just a direct comparison between the milk and the, and the fertility traits. It's 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 twofold. The the first one is the heritability of of the trait. The milk traits have have a heritability around thirty percent. Um, the fertility traits have a heritability about 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 three percent. Um, in addition. The generation interval is is uh, sorry. The the time horizon. To, to to get a reliable fertility proof is much longer. Uh, with 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 milk, it, it it you can get a reliable daughter proven proof within four to five years. With fertility, it's probably eight to nine years before you get enough of reliable information and daughter proven information to actually get a, a bull a bull proven. And those bulls then have a longer time horizon to get into the fertility training population than they do to get into the milk training population. So so what we're seeing is the the is the the, the push towards younger sires and younger sires of sons is widening out the gap between the 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 young young animal that, that that's getting genotyped and requiring a, a genomic breeding value and a reliable ancestor uh, that's in the training population uh, from a couple of generations back at, at, at this point in time. Okay, excellent. Okay, and Ross, and, 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 and the other traits, the sub indices, any, any movement or any change in those? Um, no, as I said, we we have we have implemented this in the calving evaluation in the in the spring when we introduced a new calving evaluation where we 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 split the calving up into 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 dairy heifer and dairy cow and separated from the from the beef traits. Um, we're not seeing the overprediction uh, of the same magnitude for the health traits, and at this stage, we're not seeing any overprediction on the other traits. Um, I suppose it is. Is it worth bearing in mind that, that that the main traits in the EBI are the milk and the fertility, and they're the traits that have received the most uh, selection pressure over the last ten to fifteen years, and that's where we're seeing the 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 the, the need to correct for the for for for, for the genomic overprediction at this point in time. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Ross. Look, I'll finish up now. By look, I just want to thank Donna and and Ross for their time in today and also in the preparation of the slides for this webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you for um, tuning in and also maybe just 
so you know, feel free to share these uh, or this webinar with uh, with your friends on social media if if you so choose. So um, with that, I'll uh, say thanks again, Ross, and I'm sure we'll be revisiting this whole area of of prediction bias um, when, when the evaluations go live in, in October. Thank you.